This tutorial is going to cover the basics of physics constraints, including line constraints, plane constraints, and point constraints. Constraints are used to limit the range of movement of a physicalized entity. So let's take this object here. It's a pretty thin shooting target, as you can see, and I've given it a bit of mass, and I've given it a rigid body. And if I use this guy here, Enable Physics and AI, or Control P, the first thing that's going to happen is gravity is going to kick in and it's going to fall to the ground. If you don't see this button, make sure that your physics toolbar is enabled. So what if we want to do something like hang this thing from the ceiling? I would probably use some kind of chain or a rope or something like that. What I'm going to do is put it in a position where it can appear to be hanging from a ceiling item here. And in order to get it to appear to be dangling from the ceiling grid, I'm going to add what's called a point constraint. So I have my entity selected. I'm going to click on the Add Component button in the Properties panel. And if you look under Physics Constraints, you'll find Point Constraint, or you can just start to type in the search box, POI, and you'll see Point Light and Point Constraint. Now by default, the constraint that you add is going to be at the pivot of the object. You're going to see that indicated by this little entity icon. So with the Point Constraint placed at the pivot, the default point on this object, if I turn on my Physics with Control-P, What's going to happen is the object is simply going to rotate from that pivot point and fall over. So that doesn't make sense in this case. So what I'm going to use are the transformation properties, not for the mesh, but for the point constraint itself. And I'm just going to move this guy up. Make sure that you do have your helpers on right here, Control H. And if you look carefully, you'll see this yellow sphere, and that's our point constraint. It's also easier to see sometimes in wireframe view, which you can switch to with Alt W. So I don't want the object to dangle from its bottom, I want it to dangle from just above the top. So I'm just going to move this thing up, and you see as I'm dragging this value on the z-axis, the point constraint is sliding up. And I think I'm going to want it around 2 meters, something like that. And if we turn on our physics with Control-P, I can use my pull physics tool right here, and I can actually grab this thing and see that now it swings completely freely. I even have the satisfaction of knocking over the scaffolding with it. It'll collide normally. When I pull on something with the pull physics tool, you'll also see the proxy temporarily superimposed while I'm clicking and dragging. Now, a couple things to notice. It's spinning freely, and it's also rotating freely. And that's because all of my values right here are zero. And that includes my minimum and maximum x and my maximum yz angle. In this case, as long as these values are zero, which axis you assign to the constraint makes absolutely no difference. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to switch to this axis, and now you'll see this line going this way, which indicates that the entity should only swing back and forth like this. But as soon as they start to touch it or some other force acts on it, you'll see that it spins freely. So the axis doesn't make any difference as long as these values are zero. The next thing to notice is when this thing is acted on by a force, it can swing for a very, very long time. And if that isn't satisfactory to you because it doesn't look realistic in the physicalized world, you might want to assign a damping value. Values of 0.1 to 0.4 are very common. And once I start to do that, that's eventually going to slow this thing down and bring it to a stop. And you can adjust it so the deacceleration process looks realistic to you. So the first thing we're going to do at this point constraint is start to make the range of movement more specific by changing these values from zero. By the way, I should mention that if you turn on free position, you're going to get the same result as if you didn't have the constraint. The thing is completely free to move. Since I have the y-axis enabled, I want to make this thing swing back and forth in an arc like a pendulum in a grandfather clock. I'm going to change my minimum x-angle to minus 40 degrees and my maximum x-angle to plus 40. And now if I take my pull physics tool, you'll see that I can literally angle this thing back and forth over an 80 degree total arc. Another thing has happened though, since I've made these non-zero, and this zero now does something more specific, which is it prevents it from rotating. It literally only moves perpendicular to this y-axis line. And you notice my damping kicking in and it's slowing down. Now what if I do want to be able to give it a bit of twist? I'm going to change this maximum angle to a small value, 10 degrees. And now when I grab it with the pull physics tool, you'll see this little cone up here at the top of the object emanating from the constraint itself. And that's a visual representation of this 10 degrees of YZ rotation that I've now allowed it. Now, what if I want to go back to the case of making it swing into the scaffolding here, only on the x-axis? Well, I'm going to make this value 0, and I'm going to come in here and make this 1, turn on my physics again with Control-P, and now I can swing this thing and knock over the scaffolding. 
If I only want it to move along that axis, I'll go back to zero on my YZ angle, and now I literally have this kind of movement. And there's nothing stopping you here. You can make this minus 180 would do the job and give us a full 360 degrees of rotation. Now another thing that may not be immediately obvious, you can position your constraint anywhere you like. So for example, I could take this constraint and move it out in front of the object like this. Maybe not quite so much. And now when I enable physics, the whole object is going to swing in an arc relative to that point out there in space. So this can help you assemble more complex mechanisms with interlinked parts. So let's take a look at a few use cases. I have three versions of the entity just hanging out here in space, and I have a point constraint right at the top of each one of them. And the only difference is the axis. This one is going to swing back and forth like a pendulum, and I've given it a full 360 degree range of movement from minimum to maximum. This one is only going to twist about its own vertical axis, the z-axis, and this one is going to swing back and forth, front to back. And in order to demonstrate this without too much trouble, I have attached a simple flow graph script to each one of them that simply uses noise to give the objects random pushes along the axis of rotation. I'm not using any twist on any one of them. These maximum yz angles are all set to zero. And if I enable physics, you'll see the movements kick in. There's also nothing to stop you from adding multiple constraints. You can mix and match them as you like. Just keep in mind that if they conflict, your object may not be able to move at all. Next, let's take a look at line constraints. So in this case, I have the same target only with wheels that's supposed to glide along a track driven by a motor. So in this case, if I go ahead and use my move gizmo, you can see in the properties the transform up there that I'm moving it along the Y axis. The only thing is that I want to limit that range of movement so it doesn't pop off the edges of the track. So with the object selected, I'm going to go back to Add Component. Again, under Physics Constraints, I'm going to choose Line Constraint. Make sure your helpers are on, and if you still don't see the constraint, try switching to Wireframe View. And there's our constraint right there along the vertical axis, which is the default. So I want to move along the y-axis, so I'm going to make this 1. And you'll notice something funny, which is if you already have a positive value on one of the constraint axes, and you try to add a positive value on the other, it's going to try and split the difference. So you can create more complex sorts of movement along multiple axes at the same time. So what I want to do is try the axes until I've got it lined up with the axis of movement that I'm looking for. And then I need to adjust my minimum and maximum limits. Maximum limit is going to be in a positive direction this way, and minimum limit is going to be the other direction. So I'm just going to try a negative one and one, and you can see that that's not quite the length of our track, so I'm just going to keep clicking on here until I get values that are about the length of the track, a little bit shorter on that side. Again, I've written a flow graph script. In this case, all it does is use one dimensional noise. It uses the initial position of the object as the seed for the noise node and then builds on that with any amount of force that you want to do, and I'm feeding that just into the y-axis. So if we enable physics, this is what it looks like. I've got random movement, and if you turn on wireframe view, you can actually see the line constraint moving with the object. However, that's a little bit deceptive because it's just moving to the edges that were defined in this range up here. And if it looks too far, I can go ahead and tweak this while my script is running and make it go not so close to the edge, particularly on that maximum limit over there. Another thing that you might want to do in some cases is disable attachment collisions with this checkbox here, which is true of my case since the proxy for this sliding target does collide with the track itself. Now, if you don't want this to go exactly long in X, Y, or Z axis, you can't use the transform properties as you might expect to rotate it. You have to use a combination of values. For instance, if I wanted a 45 degree angle parallel to the floor, I need to type a 1 in both X and Y, and I'll get this value here. If I make one of these negative, then I can rotate it 180 degrees from that. I can even do this and include a vertical component like so. So for example, over here, I've got the same thing on this track sliding this way, and I also have an example here where I've placed the constraint at a 45 degree angle on the Z axis and moving on the Y axis. And using the same flow graph script emphasizing movement on the z-axis, I have a target that slides up and down along a slanted track. In this example back here, it's exactly the same thing, only I've rotated the object and I have it gliding toward the shooter and away from the shooter. So what a line constraint lets you do is simply make your movement an axis between two points and disallows the object from tilting, falling over, or moving in any other direction. 
unless you turn off lock rotation. In this case, that doesn't make much sense, but there may be use cases where it does. Now let's move on to the third kind of constraint, which is a plane constraint. And as you can guess, this starts to allow us to move along two different axes simultaneously. So same procedure, I'm going to grab my physicalized entity, click on Add Component, type in Plane, or go to the Physics Constraints group and grab my constraint. I'm going to turn on my helpers so I can actually see the constraint. And the default axis of Z, which may seem a little bit counterintuitive, is the one that I want in this case. I literally want the object to move freely around the ground, rolling around but without going up or down. You'll notice that there's a default twist as well. And if I turn on my physics and use my pull physics tool, you'll notice exactly how this object can move. So again, I have a small script written for this. This is what it looks like. It just simply pushes along the X and Y axes, ignores the Z axis. And I've gone ahead and attached a camera to this thing so that you can watch it move. I'm going to go to full screen view and go into game mode. And this is what it looks like right now. I have the camera following the entity with a little bit of a delay, about an eight tenths of a second lag time. And I'm using a face hat node so that the camera always faces the front of the target. Again, you're free to move your constraint anywhere you want. You can offset the position of the plane constraint with its own transform values here. That includes rotation, so it's a bit easier than mixing these values, although you can also do that as well. In this case, what I'm going to do is move my constraint up in the air just to the head of the moving target. Let's take a look at what these three values do. Twist rotation does exactly what you might think, but the axis may not be obvious unless you pay attention to this yellow line here. If I turn off my script and enable physics and use my pull physics tool, you'll see that with the current values, that means it can rotate completely freely around the vertical or Z axis. If I don't want that, for example, if I want the target to always face the shooter, and the shooter's always coming from the same angle, or a fixed position, I can turn these to zero, and now I can move about the X and Y axis, but the object itself is not going to rotate. If I want to be able to make it wobble a bit from this point where this plane intersects this line, that's my bend max angle. This essentially is like combining a point constraint and a plane constraint. So while my movement is still limited to X and Y, you see this cone that represents the angle of movement around the point where the constraint is attached to the object. So I've removed the twist values and made them zero, so the target is always going to face us, and given it a little bit of wobble with the bend max angle of 20 degrees. This is what it looks like. Not exactly realistic physically, but you get the idea about using the constraint. There are many, many ways to implement all three of these constraints, including mixing them together. Here's an implementation of this same script and the same plane constraint, just on a larger scale, filling a room full of moving targets. That covers the basics of using the three main types of constraints. In the Advanced Constraints tutorial, we'll cover the use of more complex shapes like spline curves to constrain movement.